Just so you know, when we talk about lobotomizing people, we mean severing connections in the frontal lobe part of the brain. We guess you could compare it to deleting some major files in a computer's operating system, but not messing with the motherboard. According to an article in Live Science, doctors might still do this today to switch off parts of the brains of patients with a mental illness that's beyond other forms of treatment. But it's not common, and the procedure said one doctor is much more elegant. What he meant by this is that these days you won't find doctors shoving an ice pick through a patient's eye to get to the bit of fleshy wiring doing the damage. Before we get into someone who could be called the king of this procedure, or perhaps overlord of lobotomy, we'll give you a quick rundown about the history of snipping wires in the frontal lobes. As we said, after a lobotomy, the motherboard is mainly left intact. The frontal lobes are where much of the hard thinking goes on in the brain. Other parts of the brain help you to stand, to breathe, to notice what's going on around you, or warn you of impending pain. But the complex processing gets done in the front. This is how we differ from other animals, and perhaps why dogs don't have existential crises. As one doctor said back in the day, the emphasis on lobotomy was to reduce the complexity of psychic life. They wanted to shut you down, and we might recall that as far back in the 19th century and early 20th century, doctors didn't really know what to do with patients suffering from some serious psychosis, often a danger to themselves or others. R.D. Lang, they were not. And there was a term called therapeutic nihilism, which basically espoused the theory that some people were broken beyond repair. You couldn't just turn those folks off, that would be murder. So doctors of the brain decided the next best thing was to cut those wires where they believed the mental storm was being brewed. You'll soon see that these storms were maybe the kind you might find in a teacup. And doctors were at these times perhaps a little too trigger happy when it came to lobotomies. In modern times, this procedure gained momentum in the 19th and 20th century as we said. And we're sure many of you have watched the harrowing scene in the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which was based on the book of the same name written by merry prankster Ken Kesey. He knew what he was talking about because he had talked with mental patients while working in hospitals. While the movie depiction of electroconvulsive therapy has been called by doctors very realistic, but while that might look utterly brutal, things had been worse. Now we have to go back to the 1880s and introduce a Swiss physician called Gottlieb Burkhardt. He had noted that giving patients with schizophrenia, those often experiencing frightening hallucinations, a lobotomy had made them rather calm. He also noted that one of his patients took their own life after the procedure and another died during it. He would basically go under the hood of patients and surgically remove the parts of the brain that he believed caused those excitations, the overstimulation. He claimed that he had a 50% success rate, with failure sometimes becoming epileptic or suffering from sensory aphasia, which means severely limiting comprehension and the ability to communicate. Despite those mishaps, physicians all over Europe were jumping on the lobotomy train. It wasn't until 1935 that a Portuguese neurologist called Antonio Igas Moniz targeted only the frontal lobes, so he's the one who is mainly responsible for inventing what we might call the modern lobotomy. He started with chimps and then rolled out his procedure to humans. He said he had made unruly chimps, aggressive ones that threw their dung around the lab, into nice and calm chimps, adding that he believed the effect would be the same in humans. Many other experts in the field were doubtful, but others were not. The procedure then usually consisted of trephining or using a hole saw drill into the skull and injecting alcohol into the white matter of the brain in the frontal lobe. It was crude, and as Jeffrey Dahmer found out some years later, it wasn't always successful. Physicians tried this on many patients, going into different parts of the frontal lobe. They then used another bit of apparatus which was like a drill with a wire loop on the end. When the loop was pulled tight, it removed a bit of the brain. The patients chosen might be suffering from depression, mania, schizophrenia, or panic disorders. Lobotomy soon took off in the USA, UK, and other parts of Europe, but was often called leucotomy. The procedures differed, but let's just say they usually involved injecting something into the brain or removing a bit of the brain. In the USA, one physician had remarked on the sheer genius of the Portuguese doctor, and so soon insanity or mere mental illness of a less severe kind was dealt with using similar methods. Except in the US, a rather novel way of lobotomizing patients was soon introduced, and this was called the transorbital lobotomy. You see, the former procedure was quite the difficult surgery. It was time-consuming, costly, required anesthesia, and the Americans wanted a way to disconnect a mental patient that was fast, cheap, and convenient. And so what could be better than just shoving an ice pick through someone's eye? 
trans means through, orbital means the eyes. It was a doctor called Walter Freeman that first had this eureka moment, and to practice this kind of drive-through frontal lobe invade and destroy method, he practiced in his kitchen on grapefruits before moving on to the cadavers. It was simple enough, position the ice pick, really called an orbitoclast, pointing slightly upwards at the eye socket. Then you need to bring in a mallet to hit the spike through some bone, and then a bit of fiddling about and voila, you were mixing it with the frontal lobe. This wasn't about taking bits of the brain out, or imbuing white matter with strong alcohol, but about severing neural pathways. The old loop and scoop method was seen as a bit old school, and it took way too much effort. It said the transorbital lobotomy only took about 10 minutes and was as cheap as getting a tooth pulled. Now, you wouldn't wish this on your worst enemy, and one can only imagine the look on the face of the first live patient when the doctor waltzed into the room with an ice pick and mallet and told him some work needed to be done behind his eyes. It's Freeman who is the star of today's show, but star may be too good of a term for him. As we said, thousands of transorbital lobotomies took place in America and more beyond, but it's said that Freeman did the procedure himself at Athens State Hospital, formerly Athens Lunatic Asylum, at least 200 times and around 3,400 times across the US. According to CNN, he did 24 in one day at a hospital in West Virginia. That's why we've chosen him as our overlord of the lobotomy. As people might say, he had his technique down. According to NPR, this lobotomy did make patients rather calm, if not bovine to a fault. Although according to one writer, some patients seemed to improve, some became vegetables, some appeared unchanged and others died. Hmm, one might suggest it wasn't a total success. Still, lobotomies were all the rage in America, with the New York Times in 1937 writing that they were a miracle cure for tension, apprehension, anxiety, depression, insomnia, suicidal ideas, delusions, hallucinations, crying spells, melancholia, obsessions, panic states, disorientation, psychalgesia or pains of psychic origin, nervous indigestion, and hysterical paralysis. You heard that right, too much crying and you might have Dr. Icepick come knocking at the door. It's a good thing E.T. hadn't been written yet. We're told from 1940 to 1944 there were only 684 lobotomies performed in the USA, but in 1949 there were 5,074 procedures alone. By 1951, 18,608 Americans had had their brains done, and according to NPR, around 10,000 of those were with an ice pick. While lobotomies did eventually fall from grace in the US, it wasn't until around 50,000 folks had been through the procedure. Did it hurt? Well, one former patient called Howard Dully told The Guardian in 2008 that he had gotten a Walter Freeman special when he was 12. He said he didn't remember anything of the actual procedure because the modus operandi of the day was to give the patient electric shocks until they were out of it. He said he woke up the next day with black swollen eyes and a terrible headache. I was a zombie. I had no awareness of what Freeman had done, he said. The thing was, the kid was only a bit naughty, but his parents didn't like that. Freeman remarked to the boy, he has a vicious expression on his face some of the time, and that was that. He was incorrectly diagnosed as being schizophrenic. Dully said later that while he could live a normal life, it always felt to him like something was missing. Sources differ, but we're told for the procedure Freeman might charge around $200 to $250 in today's money. That must have felt like quite the bargain for parents tired of telling their child off. This wasn't only happening in the USA. One guy in Leeds, England told The Guardian about his transorbital lobotomy in 1962. It felt like a broom handle was being pushed in my brain and my head was splitting apart. Doctors didn't even sedate him, and that was common within the milieu of tough love medicine back then in the UK. Apparently, he had showed signs of aggression in childhood and doctors thought an ice pick to the brain was the cure. The Guardian writes that after his run-in with the metal spike, he became homeless, drug addicted and an alcoholic, a petty criminal with little concept of how to live a normal life. You might think that that's bad, but as we said, others just died. We're told some of Freeman's patients lost their personality altogether and others were left paralyzed. And believe it or not, in a book about Freeman, it's written that the doctor had an idea for his version of a brave new world without mental illness. Instead of waiting for a patient to completely lose it, why not get them when they first start showing signs of mental illness? Nip the problem in the bud, so to speak. He began advocating lobotomies for patients like Howard Dully, who, if they had psychiatric disorders at all, were not seriously ill. 
and he began advocating it as an early intervention, said one writer who wrote a book about the history of lobotomies. Not long after lobotomies fell out of fashion in the 1950s, antipsychotic and antidepressant drugs came to the market. While brains might still have been frazzled by electric shocks, the drugs won for the most part. One doctor did tell Live Science that you might have a bit of your brain removed these days if all other treatments have failed, but he said, you're not going in with an ice pick and monkeying around. That's good to know. And to think back in the day, not even that far back in the day, crying a lot or having a bad temper might have resulted in Dr. Freeman sharpening his ice pick. What do you think about this? Tell us in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other show, The Crazy Nazi Doctor. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.